everyone. Welcome back to the Catholic Culture Podcast. I am here today with a special conversation partner, my friend uh, Nathan Douglas. Nathan is a Canadian filmmaker and writer and uh, oftentimes joins us as a a guest co-host on uh, our other show, Criteria, the Catholic Film Podcast. Hey, Nathan, how's it going? Hey, Thomas. Going good. So the impetus for this discussion today is uh, a recent YouTube video on the Pints with Aquinas channel uh, where Father Gregory Pine, a Dominican friar, um, he put out this video called I Stopped Listening to Music. And in this video, he uh, makes some observations about some of the risks of contemporary mass entertainment in possibly, uh, particularly uh, music and movies, in possibly impeding the spiritual life, the contemplative life. And uh, not so much in terms of their moral content, which should be obvious to Catholics, so that's something to be concerned about, but more in terms of their form and their style, the way that it uh, stimulates the senses or impacts the imagination, impedes recollection. We agreed with his points, uh, generally speaking, in, as so far as the, the contemporary pop culture is concerned, but we thought that it was worth also responding to someone, some of them and expanding the discussion uh, to what is it about the, the pop culture versions of these art forms that can impede the spiritual life and what forms of those art forms can actually aid the contemplative uh, calling of man. Um, So this video is not really criticizing uh, him, but using uh, some of his points as a jumping off points to talk about some things that we think are adding to the discussion. And, uh, you know, maybe he'll see this, maybe he won't. But um, I'm hoping that people who are interested in going deeper uh, into the arts and how they interact with the spiritual life will find this and and uh, get something out of it. Um, So, uh, yeah, Nathan, uh, what was your initial reaction to the video? Yeah, so I really enjoyed the video. Um, I especially liked how he emphasized, uh, you know, what, you know, it's his policy for kind of protecting the interior life. Um, And I think it's, I I love that he brought that up because the question of how to integrate that and how to protect that, but also how to kind of uplift it through, you know, proper use of media Mm -hmm. is a really important question. And in my experience, it's not one that kind of gets discussed a whole lot at the formal level, you know, where it's looking at how we make things, looking at how we make things and how that actually can have an effect on our souls. Um, It's usually, as you already alluded to, it's already, it's usually discussed at the level of the moral or perhaps the level of like um, the instructive, you know, the, the, the Catholics have a very good grasp on kind of the problems of the good and the problems of truth that kind of integrate or interact with, with moving images, with media, with film in particular. But not so much with uh, the question of beauty is kind of one that's been underexplored, and certainly in the the work that I you know do on Criteria and and elsewhere, um, this is kind of the main thing that I'm interested in. So you know when Father talks about you know kind of for the sake of protecting the interior life, he's kind of given up most or all uh, media of this kind. You know that's when my ears perk up because uh, the church has already said that there is a role for these forms of media in um, in human life and in the life of the church. Now, we haven't really um, sort of explored the depths of what that role is, but Father Pine's video gives us an opportunity to really kind of look at how that works, not so much tied to the question of what we are making in terms of the, you know, content, but how we make it. And as a filmmaker, you know, this is a, uh, an absolutely critical, important question. How do you make something um, that is well-made? And what is its relation ultimately to building up right. the life of the church? Yeah, and I should add for those who don't know, uh, my background also involves music. I have a degree in music and uh, have been um, a professional jazz pianist on and off at various times in my life. Um, and so that's going to be the area that I'm focusing on in this video. And, and that's why I wanted to have you on, Nathan, is because your area is film, my area is more music. And so um, it would be great because these are the the, the art forms that he singles out or the, the entertainment forms that he singles out. Um, and uh, I've been thinking about this relationship between music and the emotions, music and the senses for over 10 years now, um, as I sort of work through the issues and, and look at the way that Catholics and conservatives have talked about these things, um, especially in, in recent decades. Um, so it's something that I've written about and thought about quite a bit, um, and, I, and I'm, I'm excited to have the opportunity to discuss it in, uh, in this context. So I guess the only other thing I'll say before we start off by summarizing some of Father 
Pine's points um, is that it's not surprising to me that, of course, uh, Pines with Aquinas is a popular channel in the first place, but it's not surprising to me that this video has also proven popular. It's got a little over 100,000 views now, I think, um, because this is an era area I, I, people are passionate about. Uh, if not art, they're certainly pa passionate about entertainment. And this is an area where even, again, putting moral issues aside, like, again, you, people know you shouldn't listen to, uh, you know, watch movies with pornographic content or, you know, if you if you should skip those scenes, that, that sort of thing. Um, even moral issues aside, a lot of people kind of vaguely have a sense that they could stand to improve in this area. Um, they usually have a sense, oh, I could be, you know, spending my music listening time better. They may or may not follow follow up on that, um, but there's a sort of uh, not moral, but like a cultural guilt about this sort of stuff, and um, you know that can be well based or not, depending on the reasons for it. But um, but I think that it's understandable that this stuff, you know. People have a desire to integrate, um, you know, their entertainment or their art into the rest of their life in a better way. And so um, hopefully I, I think that Father Pine's uh, video is helpful in doing that. And hopefully ours will be helpful in in doing that from some other angles as well. Uh, so let's go ahead and uh, and start summarizing some of his points. Um, Father Father Pine starts out with uh, the statement that our, our end in heaven is contemplative. And what is true in heaven about human nature and its end is true on earth as well. He goes on to cite St. Thomas Aquinas saying speculative activity is the highest because it involves our highest power, our intellect. It gives us the deepest delight and uh, in it we become angelic or like gods because um, as Aristotle says, this is the, you know, the, the most godlike activity is contemplating, you know, the, the, the fundamental truth. Um, and so uh, – Father Pine uh, follows this up by saying that some music and movies, of course, uh, he acknowledges, can be supportive of our attainment to the contemplative end, but a lot of modern instances, he says, can undermine it, specifically by harming our recollection. We need to direct our gaze towards God in this life and to be able to quickly recover our gaze when it strays. Um, in short, we need to guard our peace and the agitation or the dissipation that can be brought on by uh, entertainment or in, by, by wrongly indulging or overindulging in entertainment is the enemy of peace. Um, Father Pine is concerned that we'll get too immersed in the senses and the psychological, the bodily, things that aren't eternal. In that regard, he refers to, quote, these types of music and movies and entertainment, uh, by which he seems to mean sort of the general pop culture and mass entertainment. He, he, he acknowledges that he's not you know he's not being very uh, organized in this discussion, so it's you know it's like a 14 minute video. It's necessarily kind of general, but the, the impression you get is he's talking about mass entertainment, which offers this sort of constant stimulus. And he he specifies some of the problems with it. He says it's advertising based in the way it's made. It's violent and oppressive and urgent, even if if not in its content necessarily in, in the way that it's presented to us. You, it's the sort of thing like, oh, you need to watch this or you won't know what's going on. You won't be a part of the, the conversation. He also points out that they're, they tend to be all consuming, like with, with this binge culture in TV, for instance, with these ongoing multi-season experiences and you can't just watch one episode and get a satisfying experience. Um, you just have to be sort of on the hook constantly. Um, they, they also stir up specific desires in us um, – you know, you, you could say, you know, sometimes sexual desires, um, sometimes sort of dissatisfaction with our with our lifestyle or uh, food or drink or whatever, but also more fundamentally, just the desire for more stimulus, for more entertainment. He, he gives a you know classic example of how parents, you know, when they use a screen to sort of easily pacify a restless child, that may work in the short term, but it also just creates a greater dependence on entertainment so that that child will be always restless unless it's being sort of passively stimulated in this way. Um, Father Pine then goes on to relate this all to the life of study that he's uh, involved in. He says, you know, in his own experience, when he finds it difficult to read for long periods of time, he's, he'll sometimes put on music in the background while reading to keep alert. But then that backfires on him because it makes him more dependent on music. And then the music, as he says, comes back when he's trying to sleep and distracts him more. And these things were sort of hooked into his senses. 
Uh, it'd be interesting to hear what, what kind of music he's listening to. Uh, I personally can't listen to music while doing any kind of intellectual work, even if it's, even if it's classical music or whatever. I'm just too distracted. Maybe that's partially because I'm, you know, a musical person myself. And so I can't just sort of allow it to recede into the background like that. Um, he makes this distinction, which I think is a great one, uh, between using entertainment to numb the difficulty of life versus genuine uplifting recreation. For him, he he reads novels for that purpose. Uh, so he'll read a great novel. It's challenging, but also genuinely uh, refreshes his spirit and, and uh, edifies him uh, intellectually, morally in some way. Um, and so, again, he acknowledges that some – uh, music and movies could possibly be supportive of the contemplative end of man, but uh, the only, you know, example he gives of his own uh, his own use of art in this way is is uh, reading novels. So that's sort of a, a a summary of a lot of the things that he talks about in the video. Um, so uh, yeah, Nathan, where should we go from there? So where I think a great place to go from here would be to really jump into the question of kind of what do we do when we're encountering the view um, that, you know, media is kind of almost at a, at a fundamental level intrusive or impeding mm -hmm. the goals of the spiritual life. Because I think one answer that's kind of, you know, most commonly kind of comes up is usually tied to the question of content. It's saying like, what am I consuming? Is it good edifying moral content? Uh, if it's not, then I should just switch over to the good stuff, you know? And then if I just kind of consume the right Catholic films, the right Catholic documentaries, the right podcasts, music, and so on, you kind of get this, this sort of like, I just need to fill myself up with the right things. But it, it kind of ignores the question of the, as we were saying earlier, the form. We need to not just double down on explicitly Catholic or safe or edifying content, but to look at the way that form mm -hmm. in media shapes us and then to go, what, what is, what is really helping and what isn't. Right. So the, so two, two, two possible responses to, you know, the problem that father Pine, Pine raises would be, okay, I'm going to go the direction he does. Uh, I'm just not going to listen to music anymore. I mean, I'm not going to watch movies anymore. Um, or, you know, I'm only going to watch one movie a month or something, you know, something like that. And that, that may be good, but, but, uh, it, it kind of leaves unaddressed the question of, well, how can I actually use these things, uh, virtuously and, and, uh, and, and sort of improve the actual sorts of m music or films that I'm taking in, um, and so, uh, you know, in other words, what I'm getting at here is that I'm not criticizing any particular person's decisions, but if somebody ends up saying, well, all right, well, I'm just going to reduce my movie intake and I'm just going to watch one movie a month um, because, you know, it's OK to have some some entertainment, some junk food, you know, every once in a while. Right. It's OK to eat McDonald's every one every once in a while if you don't do it in excess. Um, but then what you what would you end, would end up doing if you took that approach would be um, – sort of surrendering without examining the sort of like the actual purpose of movies or, or what they can be in a better way. And so you're in, in a sense, uh, again, I'm not, you know, judging the choice of anybody who does this, but if everybody did this, then there would be no improvement in, uh, I guess maybe less entertainment, less of this sort of mass entertainment would be produced because less of it would be consumed. But but there wouldn't necessarily be any improvement in the quality of films that are made. It's in a sense there is a sort of uh, if, if this was what everybody did, there's sort of a surrender to cultural mediocrity that takes place. And uh, the other thing that can happen, as you alluded to, is say, well, I'm going to only watch Catholic movies, you know, and listen to Catholic music, and and that too can sort of. Um, sidestep the question of the actual quality of the things that you're, you know, you're focusing on the moral and theological content, irrespective of artistic quality, uh, perhaps. Um, so I think that uh, part of what we want to do in this discussion is to, to look at how we can actually um, go deeper into these art forms, as well as moderate the amount of them that we consume uh, or, you know, improve the moral content of what we consume. Yeah, absolutely. It, it puts me in mind of a, uh, one of my favorite quotes by a filmmaker, actually, um, Andre Tarkovsky, uh, 
Russian filmmaker who died in the 1980s. Uh, he was, uh, I believe he, he was a practicing, uh, Eastern Orthodox, uh, Christian, at least at the end of his life and possibly earlier. Uh, his films are, are very, you know, full of, of, uh, spiritual subject matter and themes. He, he wrote a wonderful book about filmmaking, uh, before he died called Sculpting in Time. And in that he said, the allotted function of art is not as is often assumed, to put across ideas, to propagate thoughts, to serve as an example. The aim of art is to prepare a person for death, to plow and harrow his soul, rendering it capable of turning to good. I love this quote, uh, especially as a filmmaker, because it just, you know, it's it's reminding me that, you know, at the end of the day, this is about mm. souls. Um, and it's about reaching souls, not purely through the, you know, the means of knowledge, uh, through discursive reasoning, but it's, it's, uh, about reaching the soul, you know, kind of at the level, uh, beyond words, which is something that moving right. images can do. And somehow, you know, part of the, I would say the vocation of the filmmaker, especially the Christian filmmaker is to bring reality kind of into the soul through the moving image. Uh, and the way in which that can be done is there's so many ways of, of doing it. Like the, the our possibilities for, for filmmaking are, are right. vast, you know, in, in, in ways, styles, genres, so on and so forth. And part of the, the, the job really of a, of a Catholic critic of film, you know, is to kind of really dig into all these possibilities and to be open, especially the things to be open to the new possibilities and new potentialities that can arise in an art form. You know, that is, that is you know, we're human beings. We make art. We're always making something new. There's, there's always the possibility of being surprised, of being hit with an epiphany that, that a, a new uh, work of art can, can give you, whether that's formal or, or content or otherwise. Um, we need to be open to that. So I guess a lot of my thoughts are kind of oriented around like, how can we cultivate that culture of openness? And it's not to say that it hasn't been happening because there is definitely that this culture has been, you know, has been growing. Um, and there are, there are great, Catholic film critics who have already, you know, been, been laboring for years. So I want to, you know, salute them. Um, but the question I th I'm thinking is how can we kind of build on that and how can we kind of expand it, uh, give ourselves more critical tools, um, not just for the critics, but for people who just want to watch good films, uh, you know, so that, that this, this, the general kind of rising tide can lift all the boats. Yeah. I think that in point about, uh, discursive, you know, reasoning versus other forms of contemplation is important. And it leads us back to that question of, you know, our heavenly end that Father Pine raises, you know, our contemplative end in heaven um, and how we prepare ourselves for that and how we participate in that end even on earth. Um, so, I mean, it raises the question of like, you know, will these art forms be in heaven? Will there be movies in heaven? You know, will there be novels in heaven? And, and you know, we know music will be in heaven based on scripture. So, so we know that. Maybe not fiction, maybe not storytelling as we know it, other than sort of the the story of, uh, you know, God's provident, providence uh, in history. I don't know. Um, but, uh, you know, we could also ask whether speculative theology, you know, will be in heaven. Uh, and I think the answer has to be that only insofar as its end is concerned. I mean, I think that a lot of these things that we do on earth will be absorbed into their final end of contemplation of God because speculative theology, um, you know, it, it proceeds by what we would call discursive reason. Not only by that, it obviously has to be fed by prayer and a deeper form of contemplation, but, but the, the day-to-day -day workings of it are through words, thinking, uh, you know, syllogisms, logic, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, discourse. That's, that's what, you know, discursive is the, the adjective form of discourse to, to make that clear to people. Um, but the, the way that we contemplate God in heaven is not going to be discursive. And the way that we understand uh, the new earth is not going to be through chemical analysis. Uh, and so it's going to be this simple, uh, moment of vision where our, our knowledge is more uh, in a supernatural way elevated to the angelic or the divine form of knowledge. Um, and we are we are just not going to be reasoning things out step by step in heaven the same way that we do on earth. So I think that um, that raises the question then of whether art forms, as you as you mentioned in the case of film, uh, can aid us in practicing that form of beholding that is more simple and more immediate 
more intuitive. Um, so I think I think that 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 is an important point because art, I think, in all forms of art, can help us to see in an intuitive way that's even if its content is not the highest matters of theology always it the 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 uh, mode in which we experience it is more at least analogous to the mode of contemplation we'll be doing in heaven and i think that in particular this is the case uh with music it's it's kind of interesting that he's talking about music and movies insofar as they're two of the dominant forms of entertainment of our time you know aside from like video games and social media basically um and uh, yet, uh, you know, those those art forms in themselves are sort of, in some way, uh, not not to disregard what you said about, uh, you know, the highest forms of contemplation in film. They're, they're to some extent on the opposite end of the spectrum because music, as such, you know, pop music is music that, especially today, is dominated by lyrics. Um, but taken in itself, music is sound, you know, organized in time for the purpose of beauty. Uh, melody harmony rhythm and um it's sort of the art form that is the purest and the most itself it has the it requires the least reference to things outside of itself whereas you know uh anything involving words for example is by necess necessity dealing with conceptual references outside of the work itself and culture and any storytelling is dealing with cultural references and language and so on. Um, and film in particular is, is, is not necessarily dominated by words, but it's a combination of so many different elements. Um, and so music is, is, you know, instrumental music is really the simplest of the art forms while film is one of the most complex. So it's interesting to talk about those things as two, uh, sides of the spectrum as well. Um, but I, I want to say that in particularly in music, we experience a reflection of the beauty of God. Um, and in all, I would say in all art forms that aim toward beauty to one degree or another. Um, but especially in music, we, we experience our capacity to receive the, the beauty of God in the depths of our souls in a more immediate and a more simple way. And so again, it's training for contemplation, and it's also um, there's I think there's a certain amount of interior freedom that it can cultivate, um, precisely because it allows us to detach from the words and concepts which help us to understand reality and enter into reality, but can also help us to uh, can also be a temptation to feel like we fully understand reality or to dominate reality or to shape reality according to our minds rather than shaping our minds according to reality. So I think that all the arts can 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 do this to one extent, can help us with this to one extent or another, but in particular music. Yeah. And, and I would say from the, from the, the film side, this kind of um, the, like the, the locus of reality is, you know, this is really where it's all, this is what it's all about. You know, we have to really, uh, understand the, the relationship of film, which is, you know, originally still photography, mm. then became moving photography, moving images. We kind of have to look at the relationship of this particular kind of technology, which then became an art, you know, because we could apply our intelligence to it and shape it into right. all sorts of things that that come out of that, that sort of primordial photographic uh, relationship. We need to really look into what, is that what is a photograph? What is its relationship to, to what is its relationship to reality? What is the uh, moving image's relationship to reality? And you know this, without going, I'm not going to go into the whole history of this, but this was a you know this was the prime question of the first kind of uh, 50 or 60 years mm -hmm. of of film theory. You know uh, of discussion of what film is. It was very much a philosophical discussion, wow. searching for the roots, uh, the ontology of what is photography basically um, that ended up shifting, you know, with various uh, other political concerns and, and all sorts of, a lot of the things that happened to the, the Western academies in the 1960s with regards to language and, and culture and Marxist critiques of culture, you know, that all came into film theory and sort of took things in a, in a different direction into a much more subjective uh, subjectivist kind of approach, looking at the the role of culture in shaping the spectator and, and the question of sort of the the relationship of reality that is happening between the camera and the and the object being photographed was kind of you know put to the side, um, which isn't to say that it can't come back because I think one of the things that a, a Catholic theory of cinema would have to focus on would be to go back to those questions and really start to dig into what is this, but 
the heart of this, if we're talking about reaching our contemplative end, we're talking about, you know, purifying our vision. And obviously we know that our, our vision, our way of seeing will be purified in order to be in heaven. It's interesting to think about how media, particularly film, can can sort of train us in a way to purify our vision now. One of my favorite things that Father Pine mentioned in his video was the relationship of advertising culture to modern entertainment industry. Advertising culture, you know, without getting too deep into it, you know, it has a, a flattening kind of effect. Advertising is not about reality. You mm -hmm. know, it's about it's about fantasy. You know, when that influences kind of a, a, an art form, which we might, you know, we're, we're saying has some kind of intrinsic, you know, um, God-given relationship with reality. When advertising starts to come in and starts to make that more about fantasy than reality, you know, we can start to say that there is, we can see the influence of corruption at a very hmm. deep level. Now, this is all very abstract. What does that look like in terms of concrete? It really, what it looks like is kind of the glossiness mm -hmm. is one way I would put it. There's a, a kind of glossiness. There's a slickness. There's a, there's a, a professionalism. There's, a, there's an incredible, uh, you know, it's, it's a very satisfying, uh, it, and I'm struggling to, to sort of like find the words because it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's something that we all interact with on a daily basis. You know, every, every film produced by Hollywood, uh, you know, has has this. Every commercial you've ever seen has this. But it's a particularly slick, glossy way of presenting the world, of presenting mm -hmm. things, of presenting people, which we know, we, we enjoy seeing that. It satisfies it. There's a certain, as, there's a certain relation of beauty going on there. But right. it's not quite real. At the same time, though, to see to flip it to the other side and to sort of, and to sort of just do like home movies or something to like sort of do the, the, the totally amateur. There's no very little art or and no art at all. And it's just this kind of like strict pure realism, you know, of like a home video or something, you know, that that's not satisfying either. Like there's a part of us that want, unless you're the person who made that video, you know, but for an, for an audience, that's not satisfying because there's, there's a part of us that wants the, the true, really wants beauty. It wants the, the, the beauty and the form that, you know, is uh, graspable through a great film or that, that we at least, you know, receive in, in experiencing a great film, experiencing how it all works together. So all of this is a way of like, I, I, I bring up all this stuff kind of just to focus in on the question of particularly from the, from the maker's perspective, um, how do we make something that aids the contemplative end. I would say that we we need this, we need to respect this relationship with reality. At the same time, there needs to be some kind of respect, obviously, for uh, the role of beauty. You know, it can't just be mm -hmm. unformed. So, we, and and the question of finding that balance, you know, is kind of right. the the quest that we're on. It's it's looking into the reality of things, and just as a I'll throw this over to you in a sec, but just as a departing note about this, this idea, uh, often it's easy to fall into thinking that there are certain genres or there are certain, and by genre, I mean like, especially in, in narrative cinema, like, you know, the science fiction versus drama versus comedy and so on and so forth, different genres of narrative film, but there's also genres of kind of like film at a, at a wider level, like documentary versus fiction narrative versus uh you know experimental or avant-garde no genre you know has the corner on you know this having the best relationship with reality um or with with form with beauty they all have examples of films that excel and so the question is kind of what can we learn from this wide swath of cinema that's available to us in order to draw the principles out and to cultivate, you know, an actual culture of making that is geared towards purifying our vision. Right. Obviously a question that is far too big for this episode. And that's sort of what we're doing over on criteria, the Catholic film podcast at, at more leisure. Um, I want to. I actually want to keep with you and film for a little bit because we'll we'll have plenty of chances to talk about music later. Um, uh, I wanted to ask you because Father uh, Pine says that he's concerned about things um, playing to our senses and playing to our body. You mentioned in terms of the vision of reality, this this glossiness, but in terms of specifically. Uh, 
overstimulating the body um, in a way that's harmful to contemplation. What it is, what is it about the current sort of pop culture form of filmmaking that that plays to the body in a negative way? Obviously, all art plays to the body because we experience everything through our senses, but but in a negative in a negative way. Yeah. So first, what I've already mentioned, just about the, especially from a, particularly from a visual point of view, uh, point of view, the, you know, the um, corruption kind of of, of mm-hmm. a, our, our vision of reality through an overly commercialized, overly um, advertising um, influenced look. And and uh, one thing I forgot to mention about that earlier is just that I brought that up partly because I think a lot of Catholics think that that's what we should be doing just with Catholic content. You know, where it's right. like, if we, right. if That's we make so it slick and glossy and it's, and you know, it's professional, it looks, and there's a, I'm not denying there's a, there's a pleasing quality. There's, there's real beauty there. Let's be very clear. There's right. real beauty there. But I think a lot of Catholics think that if we just do it at the level of Hollywood, but about a saint or about a, you know, right. Catholic figure or whatever, right. everything will be fine and we'll, we'll solve this problem. Uh, and I, I don't buy that. Um, because putting the, aside whether those Hollywood films are good or not. Of the, the sort that you mentioned, um, you know, every every story has to find its own proper form. So exactly. it's not necessarily yeah. a case of imitating another form and putting different content into it. Yeah. Now that's that's more from a critique from, from about the the visual kind of side of things. But I also want to focus that in on the rhythmic side. You know, most films uh, are edited. You know, they're made up of multiple shots, uh, and so that brings in the whole question of of editing a rhythm that, you know, is natural to each, to each film. One example I would, I would sort of bring up is, uh, again, in the Hollywood influenced world of rhythm, you know, tele- TV shows, movies, particularly most, particularly narrative ones, but you see this with documentary as well. The way in which they are edited is very much, it's, it's not trusting people to keep up. It's not trusting people to, it's not trusting an audience to be able to kind of sit with a film, sit with a shot that might be lasting longer than five seconds and just kind of absorb it. There is kind of a training of an audience uh, to have their hands held, you know, to have, to kind of have the film do all the work for you uh, when part of the pleasure of watching a film is the aspect of discovery. It's realizing that you can kind of roam around in a film or that the film can, right. kinda, you can meet the film part way. The film can meet you part way. And it's not simply about one doing all the work. When you end up in a situation where one side viewer or film is doing all the work, that's when mm. you end up in boredom. And you see this with um, Hollywood films where they have no trust in an audience and they're just kind of laying out every single detail in a way that treats you like a two-year-old. And you see this also with um, very austere art films where, you know, they, they're mm. kind of holding back too much and they're, they're just kind of assuming that, you know, the, the, the totally oblique thing that they're doing is going to be, is that, you, that you'll latch onto it. And it's interesting that the, the, really the sweet spot is this, this meeting of spectator and film in the middle into this collaborative mm. kind of experience. Now, what does this have to do with rhythm? Um, with regards to editing, a lot of modern media, you know, is edited it, it, with the assumption that you're going to lose interest if it's not mm. cutting at a certain rate. And so I would just, in the narrative context, like in certain television shows where particularly reality shows, but you see this in, in like um, primetime, you know, network dramas as well. You have a scene of, you know, some dialogue happening, two or three characters, and each one has their own shot. It's constantly cutting from one perspective to another in the same scene, in the same space, so that we are being forced as viewers to constantly sort of start over in terms of our perception. Like we're constantly being reoriented around a space. And the more that you cut at a faster rate, um, and you see this if you compare, you know, films and TV made today versus 30 or 40 years ago versus classic Hollywood, you can totally see the pacing is totally different. The rhythm of, of scenes, even if it's the same kind of dramatic or comedic scene, the pacing is is very different by and large. And so I think there, what personally I find modern entertainment 
it, you know, in terms of its rhythm and how it cuts from one shot to another, I find it abrasive. I think it, to me, it, it absolutely disrupts contemplation. And part of the reason for that is that I've become as a, as a cinephile, as I've become more accustomed to watching films from all sorts of time periods and, and other cultures so that the idea of there being what, you know, there isn't any kind of one ideal rhythm that we all have to aim for. Mm -hmm. It's that you encounter lots and lots of different films that find the particular rhythm appropriate to what they're trying to do. And once you, once a film finds that, then you, you know, it's found its purpose. It's found its, it's found its perfection in a way, at least one part of it. Um, when you get attuned to that and then you start to experience art that hasn't uh, locked into that appropriate kind of rhythm, it becomes extremely abrasive. And to me, it's analogous to trying to pray and you're being called and you're, you're being distracted at every, you know, you're, or you're being called out of the room every five seconds. Mm -hmm. That's what it's like for me to watch like a reality show or something where you're not getting caught up in a flow. You're, you're constantly restarting your, your perception and, and your, your, your orientation of things. The more that a filmmaker kind of takes that for granted and they, you know, just kind of jump around the scene, I think that that is actually an impediment to true contemplation. Um, it's kind of assuming a, a, a way of looking at reality that isn't actually human. It's something that's very, you know, uh, mechanical and afforded mm -hmm. by the ability of the camera. And so I, I would say that, and, and I mean, a, a totally different um, kind of... Uh, field but visual effects you know you see kind of a similar kind of thing where the more you rely on uh particularly digital effects um the more that a scene is kind of like animated as opposed to actually like hmm. made for real all you have is the illusion of reality the more there's a kind of like dehumanization uh we're relying more on technology to kind of do something that that uh, is more removed from reality. And I think it has like a, a corrupting effect in some ways, maybe not a huge one, but it, it trains us to not really prize, you know, what is real. And I think it also has the effect of when you go back out into the world after seeing a film, you know, a great film that truly brings you into contact with reality. And I'm not talking about just like, you know, I say reality a lot. I'm not talking about, kind of like this purest documentary kind of like right. reality yeah. look at nature or something like that. I mean, I mean just reality and all its complexities, whether that's coming through a narrative form or documentary or whatever. Um, but it doesn't matter the genre. If you see a great film that puts you in contact with what is truly real, you will be changed. You will come out into the world. You will see the world differently. You will be more awake. The senses mm -hmm. will be more awake, um, attuned to, to, to life, to the world. Um, and so I think that is literally, that's where, you know, in these conversations, that's where we should be directing our energies is to begin looking at this question of purifying the vision of what is false uh, at a formal level, like with regards to the, the glossiness and the corporate commercialized culture, and also um, looking for what is appropriate, especially with regards to yeah. rhythm so that we can really start to dig into what is truly real. You know, that makes that whole conversation about editing uh, and the glossiness makes me think of sort of how my my taste in cinematography and filmmaking and more generally began to develop. Um, and uh, I'm not going to hold up Breaking Bad as like the example of great contemplative cinema that we should all be following, but it is excellently shot. You know, it is it does have some really excellent formal qualities. Uh, they would have oneers, but they would also have like long, not not necessarily editing, but long conversation, like a ten minute conversation scene, or and then they do these like musical mm -hmm. montages where, again, maybe it's not the best show to recommend because the characters are making crystal meth or whatever, and you know, there's this like really snappy editing with the music, but it's all according to it's all proper to what's going on you know in the moment you know I, I i watched that show and i was listening to this podcast that the creators made where they'd actually have like the editor of the episode on in fact the one of the editors was the host of the podcast um and so you'd be constantly hearing the editor's perspective even more than some of the other people in working on the show and and that sort of got me fascinated with the role of the editor which i can relate to of course as a musician and, and it's still one of the coolest aspects of filmmaking to me is is editing um 
And uh, but but I you know when I as I watched the show and was listening to their rationales for how they decided to shoot and light and edit things, you know, I started to become aware. Um, you know, uh, in a way, that's one good thing about a, a longer TV show that is you know well made in that respect is it does accustom you over many hours to a higher standard of craft. Um, so mm. at a certain point, I got to the point where I could be. Um, you know, in a in a restaurant or a bar, a bar or whatever, and I could see a, a TV on on silent and a movie or a show playing on the TV, and I could tell whether it was, you know, terrible hack work just based on the lighting or based on the way that they would the, the cliched way that they would shoot a conversation with like no with no soul to it, or you know, based on the glossiness of it, or based on the sort of the rhythm that something about it I couldn't even hear the sound, but something about the rhythm just felt false. Uh, and on an intuitive level. Um, and so that's something that people can actually accustom them to themselves. And, and perhaps uh, when it comes to editing, I think that that's something that it, it might not even take that long to get a sense of, you know, when you start watching better stuff. Um, mm -hmm. So that's just my my own personal experience with it, where there was a point where I realized, oh, wait, like I can't go back and see this other stuff the same, <laughs> the same anymore. It, it all feels so arbitrary. You know, uh, it all feels forced. Right. It, it, and, and you see this right. especially um, with – if you ever see uh, student films like this, you know, it's a thing that comes up in, 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 in training in film school where the way pe people cut because they can, you know. Um, and it's a tendency that I think in order to grow as a filmmaker, you have to outgrow because the temptation when you're first faced with a few angles to work with to edit and you're just like, I can, I can cut here just because I can't because it's, it's actually really cool. It, the, 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 the techne thrill of like, wow, I can actually tell this sort of sequential, do this sequence that, you know, is in my control and I can shape it however and how people receive it. Like it's very powerful and exciting. But uh, if that becomes the purpose, um, you know, it overrides really like, what is the end? What are we really here to do? What is the essence of the scene? If that's not driving your decisions, then you're just left with these very arbitrary decisions that are just kind of for the sake of it. And then it, it, yeah, that's that great. becomes very easy to yeah. detect once you, once you get used to it. So there's another point that I want to raise though, um, because you were talking about, uh, you know, fast editing, but also how, you know, the austerity of a sort of, um, and we're not bashing art house cinema here. Obviously, we're not being populists, but, no, but not. I think the point you were making is that fast editing uh, can be used in a way that is um, debased and slow editing can also be a substitute for genuine contemplation. Like it, like it, it actually can be a fake uh, yes. where it's, this is slower and it yes. requires more of an Absolutely. attention span. And therefore, you know, this must be higher art and that's not the case either. So I want to focus in on this point for a moment that it's not that fast editing is bad because it stimulates, stimulates you. And it's not that slow editing is good because it stimulates <laughs> your senses less. Um, so, uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's not about yeah. having, having these things, uh, it's it's about how they're used and this will be something that we return to when we talk about music because i think there's an analogy obviously between editing rhythm in films and and rhythm in music you know it's not that rhythmic music or rhythmically exciting music is bad it's about whether that stimulus is subordinated to a, subordinated to a higher end or if it leaves you at the sense level and that can be this the, the sense with editing that there's like a lot of flashy fast editing because there's really nothing there under the surface and uh same with same with music so it's it's the, the presence of stimulus is not the problem uh it's it's the lack of richness and depth Agreed. that is the problem because when we go to heaven we're gonna have bodies and we're probably gonna want around run around like you know faster than the speed of light which we'll probably be able to do sometimes and that's not going to in in the slightest impede our heavenly contemplation one of my favorite movies that uh, is extremely – moves at a very fast clip uh, is called Speed Racer. It's a Hollywood adaptation of the Japanese anime show from the 60s about a family of race car drivers. And it is a, it's, a, it's a challenging film to watch the first time because you're, you have to get used to the pace. It's, it's, a, it's kind of like a live-action anime you know, in terms of – it's staging and everything. It's very fluid. It's constantly moving. It's just constantly moving. It, it, it's, it can be overwhelming, you know, the, the pacing. 
but I will say that what, you know, it is one of the most beautiful films I've ever yeah. seen. Uh, it's not, you know, it, it's speed is, is part of its beauty. It, it, it just, once you kind of get it locked in, you know, it is, it is a pure joy. Um, so yeah, like it's, it's really, we need to dig into, you know, the beauty where we find it. I was kind of trashing, you know, visual, digital visual effects earlier. I want to be clear that I'm not advocating for like no digital effects because they are incredibly useful. Uh, right. I would, but I would, I would hold up a film like the, like the Lord of the Rings trilogy as kind of almost a perfect integration of kind of real and unreal with regards to yeah. uh, digital effects. And for me, the, the shot that always gets me the most is in the return of the King when Gandalf is riding out to rescue Faramir on the pellet on the planes. And mm. there's like a, a moving camera truck that's following them as they're galloping. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the camera kind of like jerks and like, you know, as it, as it follows Gandalf and we see the city of Minas Tirith in the background, which is obviously, you know, it's a, it's an effect, right? Um, to me, that, that is one of the most successful kind of integrations of like trying to get at something real, even though they're dealing with this very much more purely imaginative setting. Um, there's just something very, very thrilling about, about that. And that's, that's, you know, some of the, some of the joy of cinema is contained in, in shots like that. So it's, uh, you can find this all over the place and that's, that's part yeah. of the joy of like movies. It's not tied to one particular mode, you know, uh, that has like a, a monopoly on this. Right. Right. Like you were saying, genre is not like the, the primary determinant, you know, generally speaking at least, but yeah, I didn't think we would get this deep into anywhere close to this detailed about <laughs> film, but it's a good exam. And we don't have to ex examine every aspect of film in this way, well, but it's a good example. And it gives yeah. people a sense of like, what's the difference between a good film and a, and a bad film. Uh, uh, I bring this up particularly because one of the concerns Father Pine raises is about the coercive aspect of uh, particularly the modern shows and like the way that, that Netflix culture and, mm -hmm. and so on, all the streamers do this, you know, where it's just about getting you just to the last five minutes so that you will watch right. the next episode and, and you're kind of being strung right. along, you know? Um, and uh, that's, to me, that's basically the whole kind of arbitrary. So the mic the same principle, is in the editing. The same defect. It, it's the same defect, but it's at the scale right. of a whole season. It's the right. scale of an episode. This is something that comes out of, yeah, out of kind of corporate advertising ethos of, you know, we have a product to sell. We have to keep people's attention using whatever it takes. We're, we're going to not trust that people have what it takes to actually contemplate something because the goal is not contemplation. The goal is to sell them on something. It's to get, it's to close the sale. Right. You can feel the, the pressure, like father mentioned the pressure, the sort of the, the, the violence with which it's like, do more, do more, keep going, keep going. Like, don't stop, don't stop. And it's, right. and, and that goes at a very deep level in, in the filmmaking process. Like this goes down to the, the roots of like how you make something, you know? And right. so if we right. as Catholics are going to think about this and criticize it and all that, and, and hopefully make, you know, uh, edifying films, we have to be thinking about it at this level of like, it starts with the yeah. simplest thing as like how to construct one scene, you know? Right. So. And like you were saying with fast editing, it's not that there's anything wrong with a cliffhanger. Right. Um, yeah. No, there's nothing know, intrinsically wrong uh, with but, a cliffhanger. But it's, it's the spirit of it, you know, it's the spirit behind it. And so we have to get away from this idea that, oh, well, as long as we avoid music that's, uh, you know, emphasizes the two, the second and fourth beat of the measure, then we'll be yeah. fine. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's like, it's the spirit of it. It's the integrity yeah. of it. Um, and it's not so much, uh, this is something that'll come up later, but it's not so much the minimum level at which you can engage of an exciting plot or, you know, an exciting rhythm or something. It's not having those things that's bad. It's leaving it at that. You know what I mean? It's, 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 it's the fact it's, it's, these things should be judged by the highest depth w with which you can engage with them rather than by the fact that it's possible to engage with them on a shallow level. Mm -hmm. um, so it's always, a, as with our, you know, Augustinian principles of good and evil, you know, evil is a, is a privation. So it's not so much about what's present in these things, you know, speaking on a formal mm -hmm. level, I mean, yes. uh, that, that is as what is absent in them. Yes. Roger Scruton said something for which I love him, and I've never read anything but this, a couple of things, from him. Uh, but, but I always appreciate him because he said this thing that I've never heard another conservative commenting on modern pop music say, which is that the problem with it is that not that it's too rhythmic, um, but it's not rhythmic enough. Mm. So I think that it's worth saying that, you know, part, part of the reason that we wanted to have this discussion 
um, it's probably obvious by now, is is that um, rather than saying, well, let's just avoid mediocre mass entertainment, we wanted to give some reasons why it's actually worthwhile to do the work uh, to seek out things that are better. And I think that, like I was saying, it's you unfortunately more often see people who and look, it's fair. People are busy. They have families to raise and stuff, and these things can fall by the wayside. But you more often find people say, "Yeah, I just don't watch movies," or "I, I, I you know, I just don't listen to music or whatever." Then you find people who have actually taken the effort to go deeper. And I worry that even if this this choice can be justified on an individual level of an individual person's situation, that it ends up surrendering to cultural mediocrity. Uh, even if not for the individual person, then on a, on a practical level, if that's what we're doing, then we're not encouraging a higher level of culture. Mm -hmm. And, you know, man cannot live on uh, listening to podcasts and reading the Summa alone. You know, uh, we, we actually need these art forms. We need music. We need storytelling. And so um, – uh, even if uh, somebody might be at uh, – any individual might be at a place practically where it's just they don't have time to seek those better things out or maybe they're at just at the point spiritually where they just don't need it and so they, they're happy to have their chant at mass and they don't really need much else in the way of music. That's cool, but somebody has to be uh, you know, going and uh, – advocating advocating for these better things in the culture and that can take the form of leading people to higher forms of art but it can also take the form of leading people to better forms of pop culture mm -hmm. i mean yeah even just if somebody is able to watch uh you know a black and white movie from the 40s and enjoy it as much as he enjoys a modern day marvel movie or whatever that is a victory in itself Absolutely. because i think that i'm not i don't want to make a broad sweeping statement about um, you know, films and whether the pop films of yesteryear are better than the pop films of today on the whole. Um, but certainly that's the case with music. So I, I can say confidently as someone who knows a lot about music that pop music is, again, you can always find exceptions and don't get mad at me because I'm always open. Hey, I like 21 Pilots, you know, but, uh, but there's, you can always find exceptions and I'm open to hearing them, but but uh, certainly the pop music of the early 70s or of the 30s or of the 40s and 50s, there's plenty of mediocre stuff in every decade. But the, on the whole, the level of craft, even in mediocre individual works, the level of craft is much higher. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, um, can I ask you, that itself can I throw is a necessary <laughs> – that itself is a necessary foundation, actually, for people getting into higher forms of art. Mm. We, we used to have this, this wonderful symbiotic relationship in music where classical music would draw on popular song for centuries and centuries, and it would draw on folk music. And those forms would be enriched by the, by the higher forms of music. And, and uh, you know, uh, same with jazz in the 20th century as the sort of preeminent art music uh, of the 20th century during the decline of classical music. Uh, jazz did the same thing. And um, it was that, that, that higher, uh, more, more um, rich popular culture that was a support for people to go on, you know, to appreciate higher things, even if not all the time. Or it was the culture of amateur music making and folk music making as a part of, uh, you know, family life or whatever that would allow you to appreciate things. Um, but, you know, so that that brings up the question of participating in music versus just consuming it as well. But but um, there was this relationship between the different gradations. Right. And so it's like if you have a healthy family life, uh, you're more likely to be able to consider the priesthood. <laughs> kind of thing, you know, you know, there's less obstacles to that. So all of these things can work in tandem while recognizing that some are more elevated than the others. They can all have their place. So I don't want to, uh, I don't want to, um, attack folk art or, or popular art, um, uh, as such, but I think that we have to be able to recognize, uh, that we, we have a problem in our pop culture, just as pop culture and that even on the level of entertainment, things could be a lot better, you know? Uh, so, um, 
I think I think that uh, we can attack it on all levels. We can encourage people to go watch Tarkovsky or Brisson or whatever, but we can also say, hey, go back and watch some Frank Capra movies. Yeah. Go back and watch some John Leo Ford McCary. movies. And um, all of this stuff is going to – all of this stuff can work in tandem. So it doesn't have to be about being an art snob, you know? Um, and, and we can always, and, and that's important because for most people, they might be able to get into Louis Armstrong, but they might not be able to get into the more demanding music of Miles Davis's 1960s, uh, quintet, you know, and that is more abstract and more demanding. It's very beautiful, but it's less accessible. And I think that there, there has to be room for all of these things and you can't, you can't expect too much from people. Yeah. But uh but but the the very fact of elevating the level of the pop culture uh allows uh allows for people to find their way into higher things. And also not to go on too long on this, but there's a difference between elevating the level of the pop culture and saying uh, what a lot of people say is Catholic need Catholics need to engage with the pop culture because that's where people are. But that means spending an inordinate amount of attention on mediocre things because it's mm -hmm. what out what's out there and people can find a little bit of gruel there for their entertainment or examine find some meager christian themes in it and i don't want to single out uh examples because i don't want to insult things that people like you know that that don't have a moral problem and they're certainly entitled to like them but but uh it shouldn't be just oh well we you know uh that's where people are. And so we have to meet them at their level. There's a difference between recognizing uh, that like popular entertainment, uh, you know, is, is a necessary category, a category that Shakespeare was once in, by the way, you know, uh, and sort of succumbing to the particular debased forms in which pop entertainment might take in a given era. Or, or particular forms that are debased simply because they're what's out there and they're what people are interested in. So I, I know I'm being vague because I'm trying to avoid offending people, but there are forms of pop music that are just sort of debased in themselves uh, today and, and that there's just very little room for depth or beauty in because these forms of music are basically defined by what they lack more than what is present. You know, you know what I mean? Uh, so uh, that's not what, what, what Catholics should be doing when they in, engage with the pop culture. What they should be doing is uh, looking at what's best and looking at what, what pop culture can be. If you're going, if you're called to make pop music, that's fine. But look at Stevie Wonder, man, you know, look at uh, um, David Bowie. And I'm not, I'm not, recommending any given song from a lyrical perspective or a moral perspective, but I'm, I'm talking about the level of craft and artistry and creativity that's put into these things. Um, and then look at the, look at the stuff that they were into and see that the best pop musicians and the most creative people were not just listening to other pop musicians. They were listening to jazz. They were listening to folk music. They were listening to classical music and, it, and they were drawing on these deeper streams. And so, um, I know this is kind of a rant, but 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 uh, I'm trying to articulate the fact that there is a place for um, stuff that's easier to listen to. You know, there's a place for fun, but fun can be more nourishing than it currently yeah. is as well. And that's because of this symbiotic relationship, which I'm a little bit obsessed with in, in music history. I, I think the way I would try to uh, summarize what you're saying is uh, there's such a profound, like we're talking about the profound unity of things. We're talking about the profound unity of, you know, yeah. the arts and, or, or like of music and that, you know, that, that there. And a hierarchy is yeah. a unity. A hierarchy is not exclusive. A hierarchy does not exclude lower forms. It unifies lower forms. It elevates the, the idea that forms. a great work of music can come out of something, you know, come out of the, the out of a, out of a musician who has been nourished by such different, you know, streams as like classical tradition and the jazz tradition and all that. You know, there's something extraordinary there that that we are always in, in awe of yeah. when that happens. Um, what I'm kind of curious about, and this, you know, this might be just a tiny bit of a sidebar, but it, 
you're a musician. So I really want to ask you your opinion on the state. It seems to me the state of present day pop music, you know, is, is most, it's more of an electronic assembly than yeah. it is musicianship. Now I could be totally ignorant, but at least yeah. in terms of pop music, it seems to be more, you know, it's the, the shift towards composing with computer software uh, and making sounds that don't actually exist in nature, um, so right. to speak. Uh, you know, I'm curious, what do you see that? Do you see any possibility, potential for beauty from that? Or is it kind of like. I absolutely see potential for beauty and have seen beauty out of electronic sounds or ele- uh, you know, electric sounds. Um, we could debate about you know, acoustic versus electric and what's better if there is something is better. And, and that's, that's not really germane to what we're getting at here, but yes, I, yes, there, there is potential for beauty, um, in electronic sounds as such. What excludes potential for beauty is the manner in which these things are pieced together. Um, and that is one of excluding life. You know what I mean? It's like that lack of rhythm. It's not just because it's not just that it's repetitive rhythm because great music can have repetitive rhythm. Uh, It's that it's so repetitive because there's no breathing in it. It's exactly the same every time because it's done perfectly mathematically by a computer and there's no human motion in it. Um, So you know, you can have a human being playing uh, a synthesizer and it might not be a wind instrument that's activated by his breath and has all those nuances in it, but it is a human rhythm and a, and a human a human rhythmic mm-hmm. breath, you know, uh, and the phrasing is human and it's imperfect and it's not the same every time, even if he's a highly skilled musician, it's just impossible for it to be exactly the same every time, even if he plays the same phrase 50 times in a row. Uh, so uh, there's that there's that element of a deeper, what we might call a deeper groove in um, James Brown's band, which, by the way, for me, James Brown's music is so repetitive that I find it fairly boring, but that groove is there. It's much more human. And... Uh, you know that's that's one of the problems with uh music today there's the there's the element of people putting together bigger and bigger chunks so sampling um i'm not going to say it's not an art uh there are a lot of things that are art that aren't particularly interesting <laughs> <laughs> good you know like uh you know you can uh you can have a, a set of dolls that you put in a certain arrangement, but like how high of a level of creativity is that when the pieces are all put together mm-hmm. for you already. And so sampling is a similar kind of thing or, um, you know, it's all, it's, it's the manner in which the thing is assembled. It's the, uh, um, it's the spirit with which it's assembled. The purpose is not artistic so much of the time in modern mm-hmm. pop music, um, and then there's this other aspect, which is that everything is about lyrics. It's about lyrics and it's about attitude. Um, and I'm sorry, but lyrics aren't music. So that's one of my pet peeves is that when people are talking about like music and then the only thing that they talk about is the lyrics, a Catholic is discussing how music affects you. And the only thing you talk about is lyrics. Well, that that's just not what music mm-hmm. is. Music isn't lyrics. It can include lyrics, but lyrics are not part of music qua music um so uh you know a, a, an art form uh that is entirely based on lyrics uh where the main appeal appeal is the lyrics is 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 at least less music than something that can stand mm-hmm. on its own even without lyrics even if you took the words away um and uh so there's there's that aspect of it and um then and then by nature you know when you get to the lowest form of that you've got music without melody and harmony and rhythm are great but melody is in some mysterious way at the center of what music is harmony is kind of a modern development 
You know, it's a development of modern Western culture and it's a great development. And it's something that harmony as, as in the specific sense that I'm discussing it, uh, is something that only developed in Western Mm. Christendom. And there's a reason for that. (laughs) It's called the Holy spirit, you know, but, uh, but, um, still melody is more fundamental and rhythm is more fundamental. Um, but when you've got things that are only rhythm and chords and there's almost no melody or whatever kind of melody there is, is incredibly Mm. impoverished. Um, then you're getting something that is not fulfilling. Um, what it is, what it, what it does is it, it appeals to a lifestyle. It appeals to an attitude or an image. It appeals to an emotion, um, a self image, um, the words done in a rhythmic manner, um, just enough that they are a little more catchy because there's nothing in the words themselves that is remotely meritorious on a literary level very much of the time. Um, but you, you get that little sing songy <laughs> nursery rhyme quality that makes it memorable even without any real poetic qualities. Um, so not to go on a rant about, you know, what we all know is the sort of preponderance of rap in all forms of modern music, even down to the fact that there's now rap in country music, <laughs> you know, uh, but, uh, and, and Hey, I'm, I'm ready to recognize better rap or worse rap. I can recognize the gradations, but, um, uh, it is a form of music that is almost defined by what it lacks because what it lacks is melody. It's almost defined by the fact that it lacks melody. And so there's something fundamentally missing there, even though it's fun and it can have a g- good groove and it can be entertaining. And on rare occasions, the lyrics are not completely de- de- degenerate. Um, uh, sorry, I don't know what the question was. I just went on a huge rant. We are far afield um, from our question. But you were asking about electronic sounds and sort of the way yeah. you were asking about the way modern <clears throat> pop music is put together. And I would say, yeah, in terms of sound per se, uh, no problem. You can make be- beautiful things out of any any kind of sound. But once you start putting them together in a pattern and the patterns themselves are schematic and, you know, created by computers without, you know, without a direct human intervention, I don't mean uh, human design. Of course, these things are designed by mm-hmm. people, but they are designed according to a formula and they're very often designed without human input uh in in a direct in a direct performative way um and and music is very mysterious in that way that that human aspect yeah. of performance and the irregularities yeah. of it are are part of what make I, it beautiful. i would i pre- thank you for that um and and what, what i sure. would just tag on as an echo because what i hear you saying is kind of the it's not just the case like the the human element i'm hearing more even as the the personal element you know art cannot mm-hmm. be made by a computer you know it, it has to be made by mm-hmm. a person we may have something that resembles yeah. art you know that that is made by a computer or certainly a human can make art mediated through a computer um but like yeah. to really and, and you see this with with film as well uh, this is my big drum that I always beat and I won't, I won't go into it here, but just that the more personal a film is, you know, the more, and I don't, I don't mean in terms of subject matter, I mean, in terms of the way in which it approaches its material, uh, that, that you, uh, what I was saying earlier about rhythm, you know, finding the most appropriate rhythm for how to edit a film, um, how you shoot a film, the, the visual how you approach it visually. There's all these decisions that, you know, ultimately boil down to a person, a director, uh, making a final decision on how things are going to be. And when you can see a film that, that really knows what it is, it's because that, that is coming from the hands of a director who really knows what he or she really is set out to do. And there's a thrill there. There's uh, the greatest films are the ones that they bring that personal aspect of making, you know, to its deepest um, expression. And so I think that's just, that's the case across all the arts, you know, and I really wonder if a lot of what Father Pine is kind of raising in his uh, video is 
is particularly, you know, it's particularly of our time because we are moving more and more into a depersonalized uh, world in terms of um, mediation with the world, uh, did, you know, being online, off versus offline, the way we consume media and, and being bathed in in media. But basically, like the the aspect of the person is being more and more de-emphasized on so many levels mm. in in our society and. Uh, and, and sorry, just to tie this off, like with with moving image media, I think yeah, you really see that happening with um, with with how they're meant to engage viewers. There there isn't a concern that they're trying to yeah. really approach you as a dignified person. It's more just yeah. you know, it's treating you the same as as an algorithm or something. Um, yeah. But I have to say, even in um, the sort of the, the most sort of uh, committee produced films of today, the human is not eliminated to nearly the degree that it is in modern mm. pop music. I mean, modern uh, music is the worst off of all the art forms that are present. I mean, you could say poetry isn't is worse off because people just don't read it, you know, or you know, there's art forms that just people have forgotten mm. exist. But but in terms of the, the art forms that are very heavily present in modern life, music is is just completely debased uh you know you're if you're looking at a film that has a lot of cgi at the end of the day most of the time there's still human actors mm -hmm. in there and i suppose music has usually still has a voice but uh boy that voice is filtered through a thousand you know effects and algorithms uh um, <laughs> in the way that an actor sure an actor's performance is 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 formed by editing but I hope it's fair to say that the the human element is still a, a bit more present, even in sort of mediocre pop culture movies of today, um, uh, even ones with a certain element of CG. Um, certainly, we see that going away, and it's a bit scary once you get into uh, dead actors being re recreated mm -hmm. by CG and things like that. But uh, but pop music, the human element is even further uh, taken away. Um, I want to take it back to Father Pine's point about mm. recollection because we've been talking about fast editing. I've been talking about lack of rhythm. I've been talk talking about this the 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 impoverishedness of modern, uh, much modern pop music. Like I was saying, I think a lot of the problem is when is with what music lacks than with what it has. So I don't think that music that has exciting rhythm is is uh, leading us away from heaven or, or, or necessarily distracting us mm -hmm. from heaven. I'm going to qualify that in a little bit, but le let me say that I think, I think that first of all, music is beautiful in itself and it has value in that. But I, if I had to name uh, a pedagogical value that music as such, meaning Rhythm, harmony, and melody, or just rhythm and melody sometimes organized in time uh, to create beautif beautiful sounds, um, not considering words. What it does is it allows us to get to a form of contemplation that is beyond words. It is intellectual, but it rises, it, it both reaches us below the level of uh, discursive reason on the level of the imagination and the senses and the physiology and also above that level, because we are con contemplating something that is intellectually ordered, but not with a um, conceptual referent for the most part. It's, it's not trying to evoke concepts in us. And as soon as you start thinking of concepts, you're no longer listening to music. And as soon as you start focusing on your emotions, also, even though it's valid, of course, and and universal to have emotional responses to music, once you're focusing on something other than the sounds, you're no longer listening to music. And so that's part of my qualification for the fact that music ex excites the senses is not necessarily a problem for contemplation if you're using the music according to its proper end. So in heaven, our mode of knowledge is not going to be discursive. Our mode of knowledge is going to be elevated more to an angelic mode. We're going to see, be seeing God face to face. We're going to be have infused knowledge of created mm -hmm. things. Uh, we are not going to need to do chemical analyses, you know, to understand mm -hmm. nature. 
Um, and we are not going to need to, um, you know, do uh, said contras to understand God. Um, so music allows us to get past that. And I think that in our Catholic Orthodox environment, we are very focused on the discursive. We are very focused on debate and argument and on words. And I think that um, in a sense, uh, if you're only listening to rap music and focusing on the lyrics or whatever kind of music, it might be better than that and, and fo focusing on the lyrics. And then you, you switch and say, well, I'm now going to listen to theological debate podcasts because it's more elevating. And that might be good for a time, but in a sense, of course, the moral content and the intellectual content is far more elevated. In a sense, you're still operating in the same paradigm because you're still um, – could be, depending on the person, you still could be trapped in words. And part of the problem with music that's lyrically focused, um, it's not always a problem and it, it's art, an art form in itself, you know, obviously. But, but – uh, that that uh, continues that constant inner monologue that we moderns have with our constant stimulation and flow of words on social media, in music, podcasts, everything else. Um, and 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 when you're listening to podcasts all the time, and this is certainly something I've been guilty of, and I make podcasts, but I but I'm gonna be honest and say this anyway that is not necessarily conducive to interior silence any more no, than. Cool music that stimulates the yeah. senses. Um, and, and one problem that I find with um, conservative types or uh, conservative Orthodox Catholics t types is that often they are unable to be, to go beyond words and concepts. Mm. Um, aside from the moralism in this culture, there is also an intellectualism. And by that, I specific mean, specifically mean discursive intellectualism mm -hmm. the the intellectualism of words uh be, because uh thinking and speaking uh be, because of course our our end is intellectual but it's not according to the same mm -hmm. mode um so music allows us to rise above that it also allows us to be simple because it, music in itself is the simplest like i was saying it's the simplest and purest mm -hmm. of the art forms so there is an experience of oneness that you have when you're truly listening deeply to music and tapped into it, that no other art form accomplishes to the same degree. Mm. Um, even though the other art forms, as has been said, often aspire to the condition of music. Um, and this can be done in good or misguided ways. And I think that's one, that's one way in which it's good is to aspire to that simplicity of inner mm. form, that, 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 uh, that unitary, that, that, that oneness of mm -hmm. form, um, which also creates a oneness in the beholder. Um, so uh, those are all ways in which music can prepare us for things like silent prayer or for the experience of knowledge in heaven. And that's one reason that music is going to exist in heaven, because it is so fitting to that mode of knowledge. Mm -hmm. Um, so going back to this problem of recollection and distraction, the problem is not, of course, certain music has different music ha has different physiological effects and certain music is less appropriate to the liturgy mm -hmm. partially for that reason, or it might be less helpful in the background for study. But when you're actually listening and focusing on music, it's a different experience because like I was talking about fast editing and rhythm and those things being subordinated to a higher purpose, it's the same for the listener. Because when you're, this is my experience, is that listening to uh, exciting music is not necessarily less um, recollected or contemplative of an experience than listening to music that has a more calming physiological mm -hmm. effect or music that is less... Um, so can I just say, <clears throat> to put it in in con concrete terms, right. are you saying that you could feel as recollected listening to 60s jazz as, compared to Gregorian chant? 
I, feeling is not quite the right word. And Gregorian chant is not a fair comparison because it has this grace on it and this cultivation for the purpose of re mm. recollection. But, you know, compared to, I'm going to say, you know, compared to Mozart or something, you know, compared to music, other music that might, you know, be less um, visceral. Not that Mozart doesn't have any rhythmic excitement to it. I'm not saying that, but, but, um, you know, uh, the point is that when you are truly listening to music and you're truly contemplating the beauty of musical sounds, your focus is on that thing. And, and so you are in your bodily experience, all the bodily effects of the music are being properly subordinated to the higher aspects of music. But when you're putting music on in the background, and I'm not saying that this is a bad thing to do in itself, but when you're putting music on in the background, what you're not doing is fully experiencing the intellectual, and, and I don't mean analytical, but the intellectual in a pure contemplative sense aspect of music, because you're not focused on it. Instead, you're more experiencing it, it as it comes to your senses, whether that's in a relaxing way, an energizing way, a stimulating way. And so I think when, we're when we talk about music in terms of like what distracts us for the purposes of study, we're bypassing the actual proper experience of listening to music where that, that exciting effect is still there. But it is united in this experience of contemplation, and you can listen to very frenetic and even dissonant at times music and have it be a deep contemplative experience, regardless, within limits, but regardless of the physiological effect. Um, uh, of course, this will depend on the people's temperaments and and you know the, the, their sensitivity to these things but but uh the point is the mode of listening the mode of contemplation with which you're engaged with it um just as you can experience a story that's exciting uh on a shallow level or on a deep level and the fact that it's exciting um you could say it can be a distraction but it's not in itself an obstacle to contemplation and in fact it can draw you into contemplation as well so uh, you know listening to music, putting music on the background it's not listening to it and, and it can't be judged based on its effects in that regard because if you are listening to the same music in the putting it on in the background hearing it i should say rather than listening to it for studying it's going to be a very different experience uh from when you're act actively listening to it and of course it's going to uh contribute to to distraction because because you're not exercising your powers of attention by sitting and listening to it actively. The other problem, and this is how I engaged with music when I first started getting really into music as a teenager uh, in my heavy metal days, uh, was I would spend lots of time focusing on the music or, or listening to music and not in the background while doing other things, but I was so... Uh, focus on my also I wasn't indifferent to the musical content by any means but I was very much involved in this sort of getting into an emotional associative reverie and the moods that the music would put me in and sort of focused on that and that also can blind you to uh, or deafen you uh, to, to the actual qualities of the music and whether it has that depth and uh, so um, and it's not about complexity. It could be simple music, but, uh, and the point is not that emotions are bad or you should try to avoid music that makes you feel emotions. That's kind of the opposite of what I'm saying. Uh, but, but, uh, that that should not be the focus of your experience. Um, and I, I talked about this if people want to hear more in my recent episode about Charlie Parker. I just want to look and see what episode number so back in episode 126, in my episode of Charlie uh, on the the great jazz saxophonist Charlie Parker, uh, I talked about this how how my relationship with music was changed from an emotion based one to a contemplation based one. So this this all kind of leads back to a a point that I was alluding to a couple times before. 
And that is that uh, we should judge things by the depth that they're able to accommodate, the depth of encounter that they are able to accommodate rather than sort of the, the shallow level that people can enjoy them on. Um, so it's okay if music uh, affects people's emotions. You know, of course, everybody has to have self self knowledge about what's good for their particular situation. Um, so it's not really about, uh, you know, the the exciting aspects that music does have. I mean, that that is that's that's valid for any given situation. But as regards contemplation as such, properly speaking, con music that's physiologically exciting can can be contemplated in just as dis just as disinterested a manner as music that is, you know, more placid if it has that depth. So, but the problem is that you can't know until you've learned to listen in this way. You, you can't actually judge it until you've learned to listen in this way. Um, so basically, uh, you know, you, you have the problem of listening to bad music. You have the problem of not listening to music at all, but then you also have the problem of how do I listen to the music that I listen to? Even if it's good, it's like, what level am I engaging? Uh, what level am I engaging on it with? Um, and so I think that there's always room to go deeper. Um, even if one is listening to a good piece of pop music by, you know, Frank Sinatra is like, what, what level am I in, in engaging on this with? Am, am I really uh, listening to it on a musical level? Am I just sort of remaining on the surface on the level of mood or the level of lyrics and all of those things? And we don't always have to be complete purists, but I think we should know what we're doing. We should know what the activity we're fundamentally participating is. And when people say, you know, well, here's the thing I've experienced when listening to music and then go on to write two paragraphs about lyrics and not even mention musical qualities, then we know we're, we're not really clear on what it is that we're talking about here. Um, and, and, and the same with just talking about how music affects our study or, and things like that. Well, we have to make sure that we're really engaging on the proper level. And it may be that much of the, uh, the, the music and the mass culture today just doesn't support that kind of listening. Oh, and here's, and here's the, the actual point that I was trying to get at. Um, when music lacks those things, when music lacks that depth, it's not fit for being used for a co contemplative end, which means that it's fit for being used for low, lower ends. So I've never bought into this theory that certain kinds of l lyric, uh, that certain kinds of rhythms are intrinsically sexual mm -hmm. or, or that they're demonic or vicious. Mm -hmm. Or that certain modes, I don't agree with the platonic theory taken at face value. On other levels, I do agree with it about this mode makes you cowardly and this mode, mm -hmm. you know, that kind of thing. Um, because the word mode had a much broader range of associations than what we understand as a mode today or in the medieval sense of the word mode. Um, uh, so it's not so much that a certain rhythm or even a certain repetitive rhythm, uh, you know, is going to lead you to vice in itself. The problem is when all you've got is a physiological response because it doesn't, it's not musically interesting. Mm. I, I boredom is not a healthy spiritual state. Mm -hmm. So yeah. to speak, idleness, idle hands are the devil's playthings. So all you've got is this boring physiological input, which is not bad in itself, but it's not being supported, subordinated to any, uh, to anything higher. And it is objectively boring if you listen to it for its musical qualities. So the question becomes then, why did somebody make this boring music? Or why would somebody put on this boring music? Well, it's not for a musical purpose because it doesn't fulfill a musical purpose. So then you have to ask what other utility is this being put towards? <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And it might be something innocent. That's a non-musical purpose, but it might be something nefarious. Mm -hmm. It might be that you're isolating the physiological aspect of the, ex the experience, which is not bad in itself and using that to induce a frenzied state of some kind or, 
or to numb yourself or something like that, or you're focusing on your own emotions to an unhealthy degree. Um, so, so this is my response to the people who would say, oh, certain rhythms are immoral. Mm. Well, no, they're not. But when music is reduced, I'm not even saying the le- reduced to the level of rhythm because rhythm is a beautiful thing, but reduced to the level of boring, repetitive rhythms uh, and there's not much else going on, it, that has to be filled in with something. And sometimes it's going to be something bad. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Um, and you can also fill in music that has depth with something bad. But the problem – so so you can listen to a good pop song and dance immorally to it. But the thing is that if it's not even a good pop song, then it's only fit to be used for something other than a musical purpose. And, you know, the stupider the music is – by analogy, at the very least, that the more conducive to stupid activity mm. it is. So it's the boringness and the mediocrity. It's not fit for a higher purpose. So naturally, it's going to be put to a lower purpose or to a bad purpose. It's not that the con- the positive content of the music rhythmically or the syncopation is a bad thing. It's not the fact that it gets your pulse up is a bad mm. thing. It's that it's not fit for anything more than that in certain cases. Does that make sense? So I'm I'm yeah. I'm putting this I'm putting an Augustinian take mm. indirectly, you know, onto music here. Yeah, no, it, <clears throat> I think that's that's fascinating, and it it's for me it, it sort of touches off certain areas again in, in moving images. This idea of um, kind of well. You know, the enemy is boredom, you know, and, and in the sort of the it's one of those like annoying proverbs in the Hollywood world, you know, where it's sort of like a movie can't you know, the worst thing a movie can be is boring. You know, the idea of like good or bad doesn't really enter into it. If it's boring, then it's the worst thing it can be. And there's a certain truth to that. Um, but I think it's yeah, it, what you're talking about is like digging into like under the surface of like really the the, the yeah. metaphysical like uh, reality of like. What is when I say boring, I don't mean not stimulating. Yeah. yeah. Like it's, you know, I mean that it's not rich. Exactly. There's nothing to find there. Yeah. Um, It's just making me think about like in cinema, you know, there's a certain mindset that is easy to fall into where when you, when you sort of break out of the mainstream offerings and you start looking at like the art house world or the foreign films or just like films outside of the Hollywood mainstream, um, and because they are their rhythms, there's a lot of different rhythms to encounter out there, including very slow rhythms. Um, chances are, if you spend a lot of time at a film festival, you know, that prizes the art of cinema, you might end up watching a lot of films that have very slow rhythms to them. And it's very easy to, mm-hmm. because it's new and exciting in a certain sense, because it's, it's new, it's, it's, it's a novelty. Uh, it's easy to kind of just assume like, oh, that's objectively higher. But if you spend enough time in that world and you watch a lot of mediocre, slow films, then you start to realize like, no, it's the principle is not that slow is better and that slow is not necessarily more conducive to contempt to contemplation. Sometimes it is, but really it's not, it's not the slowness itself Um, because you can make a film that is slow and truly boring and truly empty. And I believe me, I've seen many of them and some of them win awards, you know, and this isn't about doing a Mm -hmm. whole reactionary thing on that, but it's just interesting. It just, it just goes to show like if we're searching for, the, the the roots the essence of these things you know where it seems that we keep coming back to uh you know this 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 desire for richness this search for richness and that this acknowledgement that richness you know uh is 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 possible to find across a wide variety of categories and genres and i think half the problem that we run into in our discourse on this especially within the church is getting hung up on categories and getting hung up on genres uh, as the kind of like determinative mm-hmm. factors for, for something's value. We have to look at the spirit, yeah. you know, uh, ultimately talking about what, uh, you know, judging music based on whether it has syncopation is ironically a, a kind of a carnal way of looking at things, mm-hmm. you know? Um, so, yeah. I just wonder, I guess my question I throw out to you is kind of like, how, how do you imagine so much of what we're talking about, you know, poses problems of education, you know, and 
<clears throat> to look at like, I know there's not, a, we were talking before the podcast about how there isn't a lot of, or there maybe isn't, there's very little magisterial teaching on music as, you know, per se about music. As such, uh, it's yeah. concerned with the liturgy. With film, it's kind of the opposite because like film has no real relationship to the liturgy, but there's, there's a fair amount of magisterial writings on, on film just to, yeah. as film. Yeah. Uh, and we can put. I think that we can put these documents in the content in the category of Catholic social teaching. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. That's. I, I would agree. Yeah. Because that's their purpose, right? What, what I would ask you know? is like, um, so the thing I was, um, which leaps out to me in a lot of those, and I haven't read all the documents all the way through, you know, but but what I've seen and in, in, in looking at, sort of uh, them generally is, the theme of education. Like education is something that the popes constantly hit on the formation of the young, but you know, obviously education extends to all ages and it's this idea. It's very easy to have a, a sort of a very narrow, modernized, technical, technologically te technocratic kind of vision of education as simply, mm -hmm. you know, the way that our society envisions it as like giving you the necessary skills to, to do what the society needs you to do. Um, obviously the popes are, you know, writing in a, mode about education in, in the more like Newman sense, the, the, the edification, the, of the whole, the whole man. Um, and so I'm curious about like, how do you, what, how do you think we overcome the challenge of educating, uh, the faithful to have the ability to kind of transcend, you know, the, the bodily response, you know, because I think a lot of people are responding that they're, they're experiencing like, the physiological response and they're realizing that the passionate, you know, there is the possibility of pa that the passions are being awakened. Uh, how, how do people learn to, you know, transcend that, I guess, and, and to enjoy the music for well, its own I think sake. Like, I think like everything, it starts in childhood and it starts with just exposure. That's the most basic form of education. And it's also happens to be the highest way of experience experiencing things because ultimately simplicity is superior to complexity a simplicity of beholding uh that's rich is 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 superior to that intermediate stage of analysis which is ultimately for the sake of a simple gaze as i was talking about before um so I, I think that it doesn't have to be over intellectualized especially if the person has had the benefit of experiencing this from childhood as something that's normal, you know? Um, I think that it can take root in experience, self-knowledge, and common sense to a large extent in those instances. I think that insofar as people in the Catholic world come to a lot of their knowledge of the faith through, you know, media as much as through their own upbringing, I think that um yeah i think that i think that the people who are influential in catholic media just need to um challenge themselves more mm. and go deeper on this stuff and i think that they need to do it intellectually and experientially and they need to be willing to challenge their listeners as well they need to be willing to not go to the lower lowest common denominator and do the thing the bad version of the thing i talked about before well we have to engage with the pop culture so I'm going to focus – everybody has to decide what they're called to focus on, but um, it can be easy to just focus on what's popular, the expense of what's higher or the expense of what's deeper. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that uh, I think that the people in responsibility, the people who are leading thought, thought leaders and influencers, so to speak, you know, uh, need to do this. Um, the church is – kind of put out some of these ideals, at least in a broad sense with, you know, John Paul II's letter to artists mm -hmm. and, and things like that. And, um, I think that the people in the Catholic art world, I think are more and more, um, adequately intellectually formed about this mm -hmm. stuff. I don't mean that artists need to be theoretical, um, in terms of philosophy, obviously they need to understand the principles of their mm -hmm. own art form, but, 
But I mean, in terms of critics and scholars and the people who interact with Catholic artists, I think there's a greater sensitivity probably than there used to be. And I think that there's a greater familiarity with what the great Catholic philosophers have had to say about the arts, people that you and I have benefited from, like Maritain, Gilles Son, and mm -hmm. others. Um, and so I think that one of the la the missing steps, because not everybody on the ground should be needs to or should be reading this stuff, just as not on the, the everybody on the ground needs to read Aquinas, you know. Um, I think that that stuff needs to filter more into the realm of people who are not arts people per se, but are commenting on the arts <laughs> and. Uh, you know, somebody like a Matt Frad, you know, uh, is more likely to be heard when he comments on the arts than somebody who's devoting themselves full time to the, the topic of the arts, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and so it's helpful, um, you know, and I'm not singling him, sing, singling him out, but and you know, and he's he's doing important stuff and Father Gregory Pine is making important, mm -hmm. uh, important points, too. Um, but it would help be helpful, I think, that if if um, people who are primarily concerned with morals or apologetics, um, things like that, when they touch on these things, uh, they have a sense of the proper nature of the things that they're discussing such that – and I, I'm speaking in general here, not criticizing mm -hmm. anybody – um, such that when they uh, discuss the topic of the arts, they're able to discuss it in a way that isn't just reducing it to their wheelhouse mm -hmm. of morality or apologetics or the intellectual life in the narrow mm -hmm. sense, you know. Um, or even just taste. I don't even know. Just... I, this isn't something I've given a lot of thought to. I think more about my own my own work. Uh, but, um, you know, uh, this podcast – is mostly arts and culture, but it also includes other topics. It occasionally touches on politics. It touches on theology, moral issues, culture war stuff. Um, and so that I, I hope that I'm presenting this stuff um, as all interconnected, at least to some degree. And so um, I think it's great that people like Father Gregory Pine are talking about how this stuff is connected. Because look, this is the, the Pines with Aquinas is – a podcast about theology and thought and the intellectual life and the spiritual life. And so I think um, it's great that he's talking about how our entertainment choices affect these things. Um, but it's mm -hmm. also good if the arts are not just sort of wrapped into that paradigm, but also are able to expand that paradigm. Does that make sense? So in other words, music has something to teach us about higher modes of contemplation. Uh, so it shouldn't just be reduced to whether it helps us study, you know, words and thoughts. Mm -hmm. It should also be what can yeah. this in its proper mode of experience add to the contemplative life? How can it deep? How can it how can it actually deepen and stimulate? Uh, there's a quote from one of Newman's letters because a friend gifted him a violin. He used to play avidly and composed a bit when he was younger, and he started playing the fiddle again, as he referred to. And, and he said something – he basically said – I don't have the quote at hand, but he, he talked about how it seemed to stimulate his mind and he wrote better and more and faster. He wrote more mm. when he was playing the fiddle every day, and, and he, he said perhaps thought is music. And so – Music can stimulate all of those those discursive activities as well as lead us in a way to something that transcends them um, and to help us to remember mm. the proper end of these things is not in encompassing the world in our thoughts and words, but into entering some, to something that can't be expressed in words. End of podcast. No, sorry. We can we can I say more if you want, things. but I just wanted it. I just wanted yeah. to give myself props. For I know my, we got to for my. Uh, yeah. But no, yeah. well done. So one one thing that I uh, I've listened to Father Pine's podcasts for years now, and I particularly enjoy his podcast on literature. The very first thing I ever heard by him was a lecture, I think, on Flannery O'Connor mm. for the Thomistic nice. Institute from a few years ago, and it was it's still to this day the best 
single lecture on Flannery O'Connor. Oh, well, I'll, I'll have to check. And I'm, that. I think people who who know, if you know me, you know I'm not a big fan of Flannery O'Connor. Uh, I'm kind of tired of how much attention she gets in the sphere of uh, arts and letters. But anyway, uh, he is brilliant at explaining and teaching and, and dissecting literature. Um, but one thing I want to kind of uh, sort of throw out there as a question, um, you know, it's, it's clear that for him, literature is kind of the highest form of recreation mm-hmm. uh, with the arts. <clears throat> um, I'm curious. One thing that strikes me from the video is kind of how he talks about how the one reason he loves literature is that it, and we're, we're talking about literary fiction, of course, is that it, it, it leaves him not with like a sense image that is going to kind of haunt him. The way he talks about music is still playing in his head hours later or, you know, a movie or TV show. There's some image that you can't get out of his mind. You know, literature gives him a concept, some some, ab- some abstract truth about humanity or whatever that he can mm-hmm. contemplate and that it doesn't bother him. It doesn't haunt him in the same way that a sense memory mm-hmm. image does. And I'm kind of curious about... I don't know. I just kind of want to throw that out there as like a, a something to discuss because mm-hmm. I think the implicate one implication that it's easy to draw from that, uh, which I would be cautious about, is kind of this idea that that is the deepest kind of contact with reality, and that's like that's that's kind of the intellectual contemplation that you know that Aristotle and Saint Thomas are driving at right. in their tradition. Right. Um, that it's about. And when you're contrasting it, when you're when you're contrasting that kind of contemplation with the distraction of entertainment, it's very easy to see that as the the highest yeah. thing by by comparison. So I guess the question I think it's it's leading me to is: Is it possible to have a deep contact with reality through sense images that remain in the memory and 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 sort of nourish the soul the way the same way that uh, reading a great fiction work? You know, and and all the abstract concerns it raises feeds the soul. I would say it has to be um, because of the sacramental nature of the church, which involve words. Words are central. They both define and make explicit the form of all of the sacraments. Um, They are what... Um, kind of specify the symbols underlying either the actions, right? Mm. Water means all these different things, but it is specified with language, and that's what language does more than any other thing that we get through our senses. Um, so, but the church never just leaves it at language. Um, in any official capacity, private prayer, sure. Mm. Even that's usually done with some kind of sacramental. But uh, anything liturgical or sacramental, it's never just words and concepts. Um, and of course, that's a big point of debate with the Latin Mass, right? Because people say, well, mm. the reformers thought too much of the Mass as something didactic rather than something that. Anybody can not only experience the objective sacramental effects of, but also on an intuitive sensory level, understand mm-hmm. or take something away from on a visual mm-hmm. level, on a smell level, on a hearing level, even if you don't understand or fully hear the words that are being spoken. And that's despite the fact that the church, for example, in sacred music says the words have to be paramount and the music should not distract mm. or obscure the words. So so there's a there's a there's a lot that can be said in different directions here because the the, the word is paramount in the liturgy. Um mm. but um of course I think that that um yeah <laughs> it's it's a really good question, Nathan. Um but I think the answer has to be yes. And I think that the answer is particularly yes when it comes to art, because these things are organized around uh, not concepts, though sometimes they are, um, a painting can certainly be organized around a concept. Uh, mm-hmm. But to, to its detriment. Yeah, to its detriment. Say, but probably. 
that these things are organized intellectually and that they function by way of analogy to a certain extent. Music enriches us. We are coming into contact with being when we contemplate a piece of music. Being as such, being as something that's beyond words. Um, I already talked about that. I don't think I need to talk about it too much more. But music mm-hmm. has being and has an integrity. It's rooted in the transcendental of beauty and all the other transcendentals. And so it when you mm-hmm. contemplate music on a deep level or anything else that has kind of a fullness of existence, like you know, a flower or whatever, um, it does bring you in touch with being. And so it does, uh, Mm -hmm. it does benefit you on a spiritual level beyond concepts. Um, it's also the mode of the experience, as I've been saying, that informs us. So the mode of contemplation of music, um, teaches it something teaches us something in itself it teaches us to go out of ourselves and mm-hmm. and this is true with with all forms of contemplation and to go into ourselves in the same way uh mm-hmm. when you just focus on the emotions and listening to a, a piece of music it's almost like you're skipping the going out of yourself part and just sort of going into yourself on a superficial level mm-hmm. Uh, the great jazz pianist Bill Evans said that for him, the function of music was putting people in touch, putting you in touch with a part of yourself that you didn't know existed. Mm. Um, so music activates parts of ourselves and not just emotions. It activates parts of the soul that we only experience through contact because with other things, because human beings don't perceive our own soul directly, but only in its operations. And so music brings us closer in a way to I don't know. I'm getting to the point where words are failing me here as well as in the experience of yeah. music. But but uh um when you contemplate something in its depth Aquinas talks about this knowledge by connaturality, which means that your mind is actually conforming itself to the object. And so the object, Mm -hmm. it's a going out and a going in. So you're forming Mm -hmm. yourself, you're knowing yourself as formed in the act of contemplation. The mind in it somehow becomes sensible to itself in sensing this, this object. Um, and and I, I wouldn't want to say that this is ex- exclusive to music, but it happens in music in a particularly pure way because it's not mediated by concepts. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and though it involves emotions and physiology and all these things, um, those things are secondary. There's another aspect uh, of the experience of music or other art forms that I want to touch on as well, which is... Uh, that is pedagogical in its own way. And this is probably actually the closest to the, the classical philosophical understanding of what music can do for us, because that was very much focused on teaching people to seek Mm. harmony in other areas than music. Right. Um, Is that it, it has this analogical aspect. So music is not expressing the concept of harmony. It, is harmonious and those are two different mm-hmm. things it doesn't mean that we need to, we don't need to detach ourselves conceptually from it to experience it in that way um i don't say that music expresses you know or uh even necessarily imitates you know the sp- movement of the spheres or stuff like that but there is an analogy there is a resonance because they both come from god you know and and they're all they're all also part of physical reality and physical reality has these dynamics of movement and tension and release and all these different things and so um there is an analogical aspect to the 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 uh the movement in music 
um, and the structure of it, the formal structure structure of it that leads us, that can lead us to appreciate that and look for that in other things. And it doesn't have to be uh, a moralistic, t emotionalistic type thing where it conveys this emotion and it, te te it teaches you to prefer this emotion to that that emotion or something like that. It's I like to say music is more about motion than about emotion. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that the aspect of motion in music and the aspect of harmony and the the orderliness of it, but the, also the way in which surprise is an element of it and the way that um, the orderliness is not a stifling orderliness, you know, and the fact that music can have spontaneity and all these different things let alone the actual experience of the artist, which has so many spiritual lessons mm. that can be gleaned mm. from it. But the con the sort of formal content of music itself, and uh, I, this is not something I give a lot of thought to thinking about in a con uh, time to thinking about in a conceptual way, but we can certainly all experience it. It does have resonance with everything else that exists in the physical world and in the, and to some extent in the spiritual world world and in the realm of human behavior. And so it's not necessarily going to give us moral lessons, but it is going to uh, form us, form our loves in a certain way, our delights. And I'm not saying that in any way to say that, well, then uh, we have to sort of conceptually analyze music to make sure that it has, you know, that the golden mean whatever the musical form of that yes. would be or something like that. It's more on an intuitive level and it doesn't have to be this like rigid yes. Renaissance kind of, you know, equation. Yeah. But, uh, but it's, it is something that's there. It's certainly something that's there. Um, so, and, and beauty is often asymmetrical as well. So <laughs> that's often a lesson that that's also a lesson that we can mm -hmm. learn about uh, reality. Um, Whatever that means. I don't know what I just said means, but I'm pretty sure it means something and it would be worth <laughs> me reflecting on and figuring out what it means later. The It seemed, you know, as soon as um, in the life of like encountering art and when you really encounter true beauty and you start to go back to that wellspring, you know, that artist, that movement, that school, whatever, you know. And you, and you start to develop a, a, an understanding of why it is beautiful or, or ways it causes possible causes for its beauty. And, th and there's always these temptations to, you know, it's the, the tendency, the temptation towards academicism, right? Where it's like you make a, an academic, you make it a rule. A rule in the sense of a yeah, formula. And that's not in the sense of a principle. Yeah, exactly. And, that, and then that is, you know, and then whatever inevitably ends up happening is that, you know, the sort of the response, the rebellion to that that imposition, you know, ends up revealing profound beauty of its own. And then that has, could be turned into its own yeah. academy and all that. So I think for me that, um, you know, we just, this is something conservatives with their love for order need to be warned against. Yeah, when absolutely. It comes to and, and so I think the, I guess the takeaway I have, and I think this ties into what you were saying kind of about the, what I'm trying to say is like the, you know, the tendency towards academicism is always, uh, it's, it's, it's a closing of the door against surprise, against really the surprises of potentiality. Right. And, you know, uh, yeah. anyone who's encountered a beautiful work of art, surprise is intrinsically part of that experience. It, it, it's an op it's an epiphany. It's an opening up of, I didn't know that was possible. I didn't know that that could exist. And that's part of the, the joy of experiencing, uh, of beauty in a work of art. And so I, I think the thing I would really hope to kind of like take away from this conversation and, and encourage others to to meditate on is kind of uh if we had to summarize that that principle of being of openness to potentiality openness to what is new and what is surprising in the field of art um that you know it's it's kind of can be summed up in the principle of like poeticism of like being you know poetry in its broadest sense or, or poesis you know in the original the term of making, you know, the, the, the root of the Greek term that poetry comes from, um, to have this opening, you know, whatever the art form is to be open to, um, beauty manifesting in, in new ways. And that openness doesn't require, like, it's not simply like a kind of a pure liberality of spirit where it's just like, everything's okay, you know, and it's, and it's not the opposite tendency of the ultra conservative tendency of like, these are my parameters and anything that falls outside of this is, is, is out of the picture. 
um, it's a real balancing act. It's a real, like, it, it, it's such a dance. It's really a dance where you have to be, you have to be open. You have to cultivate sort of enough of an adventurous spirit that your your the door is open that you you are able to be surprised um but then of course you need to have your principles to in order to sort of recognize yeah. true beauty from from false beauty and and all the complications that come from you know sort of pr true pretentiousness pretentiousness is one of those terms that gets thrown around a lot especially with regards to film right. um uh, especially by people who are very concerned about concept about the principles of truth um and it's something that I, and this is a whole other conversation maybe for another day, but like pretentiousness is one of those terms that I just always kind of, kind of drives me crazy because it's people, th people use it without really, like, th there's always a sense of how, like, we kind of all know what it means, you know, that there's something there that's not, something kind of empty there, right? It's pretending to something that it isn't, but it's often leveled as an accusation against works that people just simply don't have the the where like they don't have the background or they don't have the, the 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 tilled soil to to embrace on its own terms and often uh, what's what's thrown around as pretentious is uh it's simply someone not really knowing how to engage with something as it as it on its own terms and i think that that is probably the maybe the way to sum up the balancing act is knowing how to approach something on its own terms um and then to receive the yeah. gift that it's trying to give if we want to launch into the deep with art and with beauty, you know, we really have to embrace that, that openness towards, we have to desire those things that are most pregnant with possibility, mm -hmm. most pregnant, not, not only with like meaning with truth, you know, but with being the things that are most pregnant with being. Um, and that's a process. It takes a long time, uh, to develop and it's a lifelong journey, but, uh, you know, it is something that is part of, it's something that is possible for us to do in this life is, is to grow more sensitive to, um, to the being of things, you know, things that uh, ultimately to, to beauty. So I know in this discussion, I've said a lot of, you know, high flute and philosophical stuff about listening to music and, and contemplation and, uh, sort of the, the, the process of that based on the form of music. But I just want to bring it back, you know, f to make sure that I bring it back to a simpler place at the end here. Um, because like I said earlier, it's really about being receptive. It's really about being receptive to God in a simple way. And so everything that I said, uh, you know, shouldn't lead to overthinking, you know, the act of listening to music. Um, but uh, the point is that, you know, these, these are gifts that God has given us. And so, you know, musical beauty or artistic beauty generally, this is a gift from God ultimately. It's not just a creation of human craft. And uh and so uh, I think that it's it's worthwhile to to learn to receive these gifts on their own terms. And to do that, you have to really understand what you're encountering, uh, at least on an intuitive level. And and so everything that I've said, um, I hope, is at the service of getting to that back to that simple intuitive place. And you know, not only are we re receiving gifts from God, but in some way we are receiving God himself because we are encountering, you know, uh, divine beauty is not contained by musical beauty, but it is, it is in touch with it in some way. It is behind it in some way. And so uh, ultimately we are, whenever we're, we're, especially whenever we're consciously receiving something from God as a gift, we are that it's a step towards receiving the gift of, of God's own presence. Um, and so I, I just wanted to say that because I know it, it got, you know, kind of abstract in places and I, I don't want it to become something that we're just sort of thinking about for its own sake. But as, you know, as father Pine said, the goal is heavenly contemplation and heavenly, the, 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 the contemplative end of man is not just contemplating anything. It's not just contemplating our own process of contemplation. It's not just contemplating objects in nature or human nature. It's, it's ultimately contemplating God himself. And so uh, I think it's worthwhile pointing that out at the end. Well, I think we've gone long enough. Uh, we've got almost three hours of recorded material here. I'm sure we'll, we'll uh, edit it down a little bit, but it's going to be a long one. It's after midnight for me here. Uh, Nathan, it's been so great having you on. I knew you'd be a good discussion partner in this, um, not just because you're a filmmaker, but because you think deeply about all this stuff, regardless of uh, me. Thanks, man. It's appreciate um, that. So this was a great conversation, and um, 
Uh, thanks to Father Gregory Pine and yes. uh, also Matt Frad uh, for inspiring this conversation. Let me just point out, obviously, if people want to get more into this topic, then listen to this podcast. <laughs> Subscribe to the Catholic Culture Podcast or the Catholic Culture YouTube channel. And uh, I talk about a wide range of topics, including music and, and uh, various art forms. Um, and can I, can I just throw in a quick recommendation with regards to that? I would just say as, as a listener of this podcast, uh, one of the best episodes, uh, in my opinion is Thomas's interview with the poet Samuel Hezo, uh, who's, uh, anyway, yeah, I, I, the I first forget what of the episode my two number interviews is, but with him. uh, yes, the first interview, it really goes into, uh, it's a very different conversation from what we just had. I just want to be clear. It's not repeating like what, you yeah. know, it, it's, a, it's, but it, it's, it's a master class. Way in, back in episode 28. Uh, talking about the arts. Episode 28. Yeah. I can't recommend that enough. It was, uh, honestly, it was a life changing thing for me to listen to uh, a oh, few wow. years ago. Not, not every artist can talk about art philosophically, mm -hmm. but Mr. Hazo can, and, and, you know, has studied it very deeply and, and he has a way of integrating his, his insights into the, the, the behind the scenes of art with his, you know, with his actual poetry, yeah. which is, is excellent yeah. poetry. This is a 90 something year old man. He's incredibly soulful. He reads a lot of poetry in the conversation. Uh, it is not yes. a dry discussion, maybe on my end it is, but certainly not on his end. And uh, so, yeah, that's a, that is a good one. That is one of my favorite episodes that I've done. If you, people want to get more into the movie side of things though, uh, they should subscribe to our other podcast because that's where we talk about movies, not so much on this one. Uh, Criteria, the Catholic film podcast. We're going through the Vatican film list, among other things, which is a great resource for exploring uh, the deeper artistic canon of film, especially films that are relevant to a Catholic uh, vision of things. And um, so those are two resources for people. I'd also, for, for music, I'd like to recommend – uh for people obviously listen to music listen to instrumental music but but uh as far as a reading resource i haven't really discussed this on this podcast but the best thing i've ever read on music and the spiritual life and frankly one of the only really adequate things i've ever read on the topic is uh a, it's a book, but it's really an essay. It's not very long. It is 154 pages total uh, called The Song That I Am on the Mystery of Music. The Song That I Am on the Mus Mystery of Music. And it was written in, I forget what year, maybe 1950 by a Benedictine nun uh, who was herself a musician, uh, Sister Elizabeth Paul Labatt. And that is a really great essay. Um, so I highly recommend that. I, I think it's published by Liturgical Press. I don't know if you have any uh, books of your own to recommend, but uh, that's that's my book recommendation. I have too many. Um, I, I wouldn't necessarily call it entry level, but as someone who did not study, I did not study philosophy academically, and I've kind of been trying to just like bootstrap my way into at least studying aesthetics the last few years. And for me, the most um, uh, accessible work of philosophy by a Catholic on the arts uh, was Etienne Gilson's The Arts of the Beautiful. Nice. And it's not a very long book. Um, it is deep. Yeah. And, and it really lays out a lot of uh, things like starting right. concepts and things to um, – but I would <clears> – <throat> so I would encourage anyone who wants to kind of get their feet wet, I would say try that. It's not really a hard read. It's not too super technical from what I remember. It's been quite a while. I think I haven't read it since yeah. college. But it's funny. I thought of the same book because I was trying to think – it's hard to think of a Maritan book to recommend along the lines of yeah. what we're discussing here. Um, yeah, they're all I agree. all of his writings you, on art are great, but you know, yeah, along the lines of what we're discussing here, it's hard to think of one other than maybe creative intuition and art and poetry, which is very long and not easy. I think the arts of the beautiful yes. is a great choice. I'd be interested to see if I even agree with all of it anymore because it's been so long. But uh, but it is it is very good, and it'll get you into that discussion of what is art for you know is it imitation is it moralistic all of those those questions and he's engaging this yep. sort of typical classical tradition uh tradition answers on that and critiquing them but validating them in certain certain areas and so it's a it's a it's a good one uh for sure yeah and not not a super long one either yep. 
thanks everybody for listening. Please uh, consider if you if you appreciated this material, share it with others, and of course, uh, there's always the option of donating. We do run on donations, so you can go to catholicculture.org slash donate slash audio uh, if you if you uh, want to help us keep this material going. All right, everybody, thanks for listening. God bless you all, and we will see you next time. Thank you.